thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. Let's see if uh, the magic happens. This is always the moment where we all sweat. All right, um, can somebody give me a thumbs up if they can hear me and see my slides? Thank you very much um, to my co-panelists uh, who gave me that verification. So my name is Renad Betis, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm really going to just start us off with a high level overview of what nudges are and how they might be used to transform mental health care delivery, particularly with an eye towards suicide prevention. The first thing you may be wondering is, you know, what is a nudge? You may have heard this concept, um, you know, it's been widely popularized with the book Nudge, which just came out with its final edition. We'll see if it's actually the final edition led by authors, Dr. Richard Thaler and Dr. Cass Sunstein. Actually, Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2017 for the concepts that I'll be sharing with you all today. But kind of put simply, a nudge is a change in the way that choices are presented or information is framed that changes people's behavior. Importantly, and this is a point that I really want to underscore, it doesn't restrict choice or take away choice, and nudges have to be transparent and not misleading, easy for people to kind of opt out of and aligned with the welfare of those being nudged. Um, and so folks who design nudges are known as choice architects. You may have also heard that uh, terminology before. And so the very cool thing is, is that there's a really large body of literature that suggests that nudges are low cost, they're scalable, and they're effective ways to design um, to support humans in engaging in healthy behaviors. So that's kind of the big picture idea of what a nudge is. Now I'm gonna give you some actual examples, some of my favorite examples so that I can bring this to life. So what you see pictured here is actually a subway station in Stockholm. And back in 2009, uh, Volkswagen was doing an ad campaign and they repainted these stairs to make it into a musical piano, including sound. What would you choose if you were on your way to work? The escalator or would you try to have a chance to play chopsticks on your way to work? Um, you know, that's a nudge, nudging folks to take the stairs instead of the escalator. Um, and during a one day test of this, 66% more people chose the stairs over the escalator. Here's another, maybe my favorite example. Um, if we were in a more interactive chat, I would ask you if you knew what this was, but I'll just go ahead and tell you. Um, this is the urinal fly. The story, and you may not be able to see that small fly in the urinal, which is why I'm blowing it up for you. But the story goes that it's difficult to encourage men to urinate in such a way that avoids mess, which of course is a problem in public bathrooms. So I do happen to have an eight-year-old boy. I can verify that story. We could really use a urinal fly in our house. Um, in the early 1990s, a fly was etched into urinals um, in this airport in Amsterdam, reducing, in spillage, reducing spillage by a large percentage. Another great example from London. Here, smokers are encouraged not to litter by asking them to vote with their cigarette butts on who the best soccer player is in the world, Ronaldo or Messi. Um, evaluation suggests that this reduces litter by up to 46%. And you can see people are voting with their cigarette butts. Finally, a digital nudging example before I get to a little bit more of the meat, just to really give you a flavor for this. Have you ever gotten stuck in a binge session on Netflix? That, that's intentional. The, it, Netflix is designed to nudge you to continue watching. It just rolls right into the next episode. So to summarize, there's some key design principles of nudging that has been popularized by what we call the EAST framework, which um, the UK Behavioral Insights team have put forth. So the first design principle is make it easy. Think of our Netflix example as a really great illustration of that. The default is just to roll into the next um, episode. The second principle is to make it attractive. Think of the piano stairs. It's fun and nice to hear and look at. The third principle is to make it social. So think of voting with cigarette butts. It's a community voting. And then the fourth principle is make it timely. Think of the urinal fly. It's there right at the right moment to encourage uh, proper aiming. Of course, each of the interventions I just described in the slides uh, before may incorporate multiple principles, but that tried to highlight the kind of the main thing. 
So moving on uh, past kind of this idea of what actually is a nudge, I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, the situation in the world right now. And, and Dr. Sukumar already touched on this. Um, I'm actually a practicing clinical psychologist. And I can tell you that this headline is real. Um, this is a study that was published in The Lancet finding that cases of anxiety and depression have increased dramatically with COVID-19, particularly for women. So simply put, we have a global mental health crisis on our hands. We had one before COVID, and now it's much worse. Um, I'd argue the opportunity is really ripe to apply behavioral insights and nudges, which is what I was talking about earlier, to mental health care, particularly with the advent of all the digital technologies that are available and the ability to use big data to understand behavior. In other areas of healthcare, there's been lots of activity in applying these concepts to health behaviors like smoking, medication adherence, physical activity, but we haven't quite seen the same attention in mental health care. So, you know, one key question is whether or not we can apply these concepts to digital nudging to reduce suicidal behavior, which is the reason why we're all here today. And I would argue that suicide prevention is one place where we can be particularly impactful. The graph that you see on the slide is um, a graph of suicide rates in our country from 1999 to 2019. On the x-axis, you can see the dates. On the y-axis, you can see the deaths per 100,000. Um, and what you'll see is that the rates have been steadily increasing over, um, the, uh, you know, over that decade. Now I will note, and you may see this in, um, if you go to look to the literature, is that the crest seems to be at 2018 and initial data from the pandemic suggests that overall rates are not kind of continuing to increase in the same trajectory that they were before. Although that may change as um, the pandemic, pandemic continues. Um, but when you look at specific subpopulations, for example, black or African-American youth, we see continuing increases in a steep trajectory. Um, but uh, you know, either way, the current suicide death rates are much too high and we must deploy all the interventions that we have at hand. So I'm just gonna pose a couple of thoughts, food for thought that I hope will spark some conversation about how we might apply some of those concepts that I showed you earlier in thinking about suicide prevention. And some of these are just ideas. Some of them have actually been tested in non-treatment seeking populations or in individuals experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, and so this is just really to give you a flavor. So the first idea might be um, for somebody to receive a support phone call as the default if certain behaviors are passively detected by their smartphone. So rather than having to pick up and call the suicide hotline, a call is made to that person's phone when the phone picks up that there might be problematic behavior going on. A second, and this has actually been tested and the citations are below, one could think about using a social norm nudge in a text or an email to increase use of suicide intervention. So if you say something like, 95.6% of people believe you should get help if you're suffering from anxiety and then offer a resource, you see higher uptake versus just saying, here's a resource. Another idea would be to use framing to increase the likelihood of seeking out online coping skills. So if you tell someone, you should check this out so you could help a friend versus you should check this out because you need coping skills, you see higher uptake when it's socially framed. Now I do a lot of work targeting clinician behavior. So another idea um, is to nudge clinicians using the electronic health record, which is a digital technology to talk about means safety and means are the ways in which people attempt suicide in routine health visits. And that's actually work that our team's doing. Another idea would be in the electronic health record to put suicide screening and assessment buttons at the top of every EHR note electronic health record note to really make it salient and timely. And then finally, um, and these are more structural interventions, creating friction. So it's the opposite of, um, of you know, a nudge um, between accessing lethal means in places where people live, work and play. So those are just some ideas. Um, and to summarize, because I'm out of time, nudges are low cost, they're scalable and effective. And I think the time is ripe to apply these concepts to mental health care, particularly with regard to suicide. But I'll leave you with one thought, which is that nudges, digital or not, 
must be deployed in parallel with evidence-based suicide prevention strategies. So nudges alone are not going to get us out of our global mental health crisis. We also need to be deploying and increasing the capacity of our infrastructure to provide evidence-based care. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing now and I appreciate the, the opportunity to share my thoughts. I, you know, you, you talked about my, about, um engagement and mindfulness. I have a question here from one of our um, uh, audience. It's from Travis and Travis says, I found that mindfulness-based stress reduction to be really helpful for depression and anxiety. You know, I've heard things like meditation, transcendental meditation, good ways to get people focused in, in back to their life. Can you give an example of a nudge that might encourage this behavior and and I would assume encourage people to consider mindfulness-based stress reduction, whether that's meditation or or other mechanisms. Uh, Dr. Betis, any thoughts on that? And we'll open it up to the other panelists as well. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, so you know, there's different mechanisms through which to engage people with evidence-based practices like a mindfulness-based stress reduction or cognitive behavioral therapy if they're exp experiencing depression and anxiety. I think you know one of the, the, the ways we might think about designing a nudge and we would wanna go about it in co-creation with patient stakeholders um, and evaluate it would be pushing, for example, um, a message to somebody if the phone is sensing a change in behavior. So there's a lot of great cutting edge work. Um, some of you know what was spoken about over the, the course of the, the four brief talks about you know using, for example, a smartphone as a passive sensor of behavior, the phone recognizing that maybe something might be off, the person's in bed longer than usual or isn't reaching out to other people and then pushing a message to nudge someone to pick up their mindfulness-based practice. Um, you know, my actually my watch does it all the time. It sends me messages when I haven't gotten up um, or uh, I don't actually know how it knows. It tells me to take a breath. Um, and it's not like I have to go log into the app and then do the thing, right? It's push. So that's an example of a nudge for that. Dr. Betis, I, I have a question for you just in terms of uh, talking about apps and how we engage with apps. How do you see these nudges um, being deployed? What is the best place? Is it at a point when, and, and, I, and I know you've done some research in this area, uh, when you think about the continuity of care and a veteran or an individual walks in uh, to see their, their physician, at what point do you start to engage them? And at what point is it most appropriate? How do you even take someone who has not been diagnosed to have any of the symptoms, you know, in a pre-diagnosis stage? And how do you get them engaged to be able to identify what's the right point in time to touch them? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So one thing I just want to anchor us on, and I think this theme came out so clearly in everybody's brief comments, is that we're all aligned on the mission that we want to save a life. And that saving a life leads to saving many lives. And, um, you know, uh, that is the whole point of why we're here today. And so I would offer that we should be thinking about these approaches all along the continuum, because each point is a lever where we can achieve that mission of saving a life. And I think about this from the public health approach. So, you know, there's the universal kind of first step um, where, you know, you're engaging in prevention. So for example, um, if someone has firearms in the home, securing them safely um, to put space and time between lethal means. And then the next step up on the, the triangle of the public health continuum is targeted or for people who are at risk who might be experiencing anxiety or depression symptoms but aren't quite at a clinical diagnosis. There's evidence-based approaches we can push then. And then the final top of the triangle, which is folks who need more intensive intervention, where we can deliver established evidence-based practices for suicidal ideation or behavior. Now, if we can catch more people upstream before we get to the top of that triangle, we're gonna be better off in achieving our mission of saving as many lives as we can. I got a question here from Nicole and she says, uh, and this question may be Dr. Betis, you could take this one. How did you conduct research to find the effectiveness of nudges? And there's a second part to that question. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm going to add a word to it. It says, and ensure its efficacy. I'm going to say, ensure both the ethics and the efficacy of it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I should say is that nudging in suicide prevention is in its infancy. So um, this is kind of cutting edge work. Um, there's work going on in this space, but if you do a PubMed or literature search, you're not going to find a lot of stuff. But if we look to the broader literature and we think about um, how we establish efficacy and effectiveness, typically the ways that we do it are through randomized control trials. Um, where we randomize some people to get a nudge and others not to get it. And then we look at the outcomes that are matched to the research questions of interest. Um, in terms of ethics, it's such an important point. And one thing I just wanna highlight for folks is that we're being nudged all the time, whether or not it's intentional. Our environment shapes our behavior, whether or not it's designed in such a way to do so. And so we might as well leverage that fact and design it in a way that ensures the, the best interests of the individuals who are in that environment. Um, but there are lots of questions about ethics and there are scholars whose entire research programs focus on the ethics of nudges. Um, one way that I manage this in my own work is ensuring that I co-create any intervention or nudge with the intended population and see folks as equal partners in that work. Um, and so uh, in that process of co-creation, which you know, I think um, uh, Ms. Miller described it very well, meeting people where they are, understanding their lived experience and how we can work together to apply the science in such a way that's uh, effective. And then you have to measure it and make sure that that's accurate. So um, I think that measurement and evaluation piece is critical. So thank you, Nicole, for asking that question. Just looking at, at success measures, what should our audience think about when we, th we, we think about success measures from nudging or success measures from the use of the right technology, the right medium, the right messaging, the right frequency of messaging, the right point in the continuum, et cetera. What should they be thinking about when, you, when, you, when we talk about success measures? And I'll throw it open to everybody uh, here on the panel to, to respond to that. Dr. Bay, this first. Sure. I mean, it really depends on where you are in the continuum and what your question of interest is. So if you're in the universal bucket, we're thinking about resilience, wellness, engagement with community. You know, if you're at the at, in the at secure, secure storage of lethal means, if you're in the middle kind of targeted at risk bucket, then you're thinking about, um, you know, whatever the risk factors are, if they're uh, depressive or anxiety symptoms. And then if we get up into the kind of intensive crisis, we're thinking about suicidal ideation, behavior, engagement. Um, so there's, a you know, the world is kind of your oyster in terms of what you might measure. You just have to measure important variables based on where you are in that continuum and what you're trying to, what kind what type of behavior change you're looking for.